So welcome to the Climate Teacher Ed webinar hosted by the Institute of Science and Math Education at the University of Washington in Seattle. I'm Dr. Deb L. Morrison, a research scientist with the Institute and a climate justice learning designer and advisor. I'll be moderating the discussion today. Um, the webinar series is an activity of a new effort called the Climate Teacher Ed Collaborative. The Collaborative is a teacher education initiative dedicated to helping future teachers learn to engage youth in community climate justice projects and in critical civic participation in response to the climate crisis. In this monthly webinar series, we'll talk to experts who can help us all think about how teacher education can accomplish this. So more information is in the chat about those resources. We hope the webinar series will be a valuable resource for teacher educators and educators in general to focus instruction on just responses to the climate crisis. We encourage you to check out the professional learning resources we are sharing through the climate learning section of the stemteachingtools.org website. For those of you joining us live today, please post questions for the present presenter using the Q&A function in Zoom. I'm joining today from the unceded ancestral and current homelands and territories of the Wasanich peoples on Stais in Pender Island, British Columbia, Canada. The University of Washington hosting these webinars is operating on the lands of the Lashanti speaking peoples, the Coast Salish peoples, who identify as Duwamish, Muckleshoot, Suquamish, Sinahomi, um, Tulalip, and Pialip. We are immensely grateful for the stewardship of these lands and waters since time immemorial of these tribal nations and wish to recognize their sovereignty in the work that we do, which certainly extends to matters of educational sovereignty for the purposes of cultural continuance and thriving. And that has specific implications for a just climate response generally and for climate education specifically. Today, we are joined by Nick Sai, who is a co-artistic, sorry, is a co-artistic director of Mondo Bizarro and a New Orleans born performer, producer and cultural organizer. Nick's creations embody the urgency of his desire to listen to our land and culture, develop allies and collective action and provide a platform for using arts as a tool to understand what makes us commonly human and individually unique. Above all else, he is a climate communicator. Nick is going to share with us today from his work in New Orleans around science and arts based water literacy instruction that is foundationally centered in climate justice. We're so thrilled to have you, Nick. Um, joining so us today. Welcome. Yeah. I'm so excited to be here. I've never been called a climate communicator, so I feel like <laughs> it's it's already starting perfectly. I know. I was like, I'm gonna add that in because I know you as a really good communicator. So thank you. Um, all right, so we're going to start our um, discussion of the work in the Mississippi River Delta, and particularly the Invisible River project that you've um, been working on. Could you perhaps open that up a little bit for us? Sure. Um, hello, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here. I'm going to um, go ahead and share my screen. And in the beginning um, of this presentation, I, I'd just like to give you a little context from uh, and about the place that I call home and really the place that I love. Um, uh, I will begin as well to say that I'm calling from the unceded territories of many um, indigenous nations. Uh, the place where I am is uh, colonially uh, known as New Orleans, but we call it Bulbancha. Uh, Bulbancha is uh, a word that is uh, a Choctaw word that means the land where many languages are spoken. And it has been um, the ancestral homelands of many people, including uh, the Homa, the Atakapaw Ishak, the Choctaw, the Cherokee, the Chitimacha, the Biloxi Chitimacha, um, also many African American Africans um, and indigenous people were wrongfully enslaved here. So we honor their histories, past, present, and future. Uh, I honor their relationship to this land and what they make possible in my work. And, uh, I honor the very beautiful and um, sacred relationship they had to the waterways here. So the image that you're looking at here, uh, many of you know this as uh, New Orleans or the Crescent City. I'd like to start by just showing you that everything you can see in green right now, that is land that is above sea level. 
Uh, and so the context for much of what uh, I want to talk to you about is sort of uh, my relationship to the waters uh, that surround my home. Uh, the place that is known as New Orleans was not always uh, this way. We weren't built below sea level, but a lot of things have occurred over the last couple of hundred years um, that has led us to this place. Um, a lot of the work that I've been doing for the last 17 years as an artist has been in relationship to this beautiful and majestic river we call the Mississippi. Um, these are images of the Mississippi River. They're infrared and they're taken from space. And I'm always so moved by these ancestral paths of the river, remembering how it flowed freely, um, how it moved throughout the course of this very large country for years before it was ever controlled by levees. Um, this place in Southeast Louisiana was constructed by this river over seven to 12,000 years. Um, it's comprised of at least seven to eight deltas. And these images I'm showing you to show you a little bit of the memory of that free flowing river, how it animated the landscape for about 7,000 years, it flowed freely like a river does, and it pushed sediment down to the coast of South Louisiana. So when I talk about the place that I live, I like to remember that the land that I'm on, that we are on is baby land. It was made by these, these deltas that are only in some cases, 25, 3,500 years old, all the way down to 900 years old. Um, it's land that was not built too long ago. And so if you're taking a look at these maps, you're basically seeing the way the river moved to form the land that we now call home, which would be seven delta lobes in about 5,000 years. And this map is so important to me because I like to remember, I like to animate for myself the memory of the landscape. This is the historical distributaries of the, the great Mississippi River. That's what once flowed uh, and moved through the place we call home. Um, that here, and that river um, created a, a really, really unbelievable landscape. Uh, I like to think of South Louisiana and the bottom of the Mississippi as a PowerPoint for the planet in some ways. Uh, we drain 42 states. Um, that river at the bottom, when it slows down and gets muddy, has created some really incredible territories, uh, swamps uh, where decaying matter uh, mixed together with the bottom of the delta to create these really beautiful landscapes, really giant ancient cypress trees and hard bottom forests. And of course, what our people were allowed to um, and were fortunate enough to live on for so long, which is an abundance of food from the sea. So we have been living very close to the water and to these waterways for a very long time. And what took us about you know 7,000 years to create, unfortunately, um, in the last several generations, especially since the 1927 flood, because of man-made control of that river and the uh, creating conditions so it doesn't flood anymore, um, because of the infrastructure that is now built to keep the water away from us. And because of course, in the city of New Orleans, the giant port city we are, our relationship to the extractive industries, um, what took us you know, 7,000 years to create is essentially uh, turned into something that looks like this. Remember the historical tributaries that I showed you? This is the 20th century infrastructure of the river. And as you can see, we now control that water. And so everything outside of that levee system becomes a polder area and is now sinking. So without nourishment and replenishment from the river, um, we're now living in a sort of uh, suspended in a web of what I think of as artificial circumstances. These yellow dots are every flood control system it takes just to make sure that our city can keep moving in a heavy rain or during hurricane season or any of those times. Um, and this image is the one that I think is um, really striking. This is the land loss picture that they predict by 2050 is the type of land loss that we're looking at. Um, it's a really bad stat, but they say that we lose about a football field every 32 minutes in South Louisiana. That's not a perfect estimate, but it, it's helpful for people's minds. A place the size of Manhattan 
in the last 70 years has sunk into the sea. Um, and that red that you see is land loss projected um, just to 2050. So that has really lived and real experience for the people who live in South Louisiana. Many communities that you could have driven to like this one in Point Ashen, uh, two generations ago, the old people now say that these are the places where homes once stood, which are now almost open water. You have to travel there by boat. There were once roads. Um, a lot of the roads along the coast in coastal Louisiana look something like this. Um, this is a road that actually leads to Port Fouchon, which is a place where over 40% of the nation's oil is refined. And on a good south wind, the water will just blow right over this road. Um, so people are more and more having to make very profound decisions about the future of their home in this place. Um, and I like to remember always as an artist and as a culture maker and as an educator that our culture is only as strong as its ability to survive. Um, this is something that really centers my work um, here in Louisiana. And a big question I think we've all been asking ourselves is how are we going to survive into the future? So as a maker, as a creator, as an educator, as an artist, one of the most important things that I like to do in the work that I do with my own organization or anyone that I partner with um, is to make art that does not simply name the problem, but in some intentional and beautiful way becomes a part of the solution. That is the ultimate goal, I think, in the works that we create and the ways that we gather people. Um, so the, the kind of the, the triad of influences for us and our work and, uh, is obviously art and the creation of art. Um, the use of cultural organizing, which I would describe as um, the gathering of people together using art and culture that has a specific goal to change or move or shift policy and to root everything we do in the principles of social justice. The values that we carry into all of the values-based producing we do uh, include thinking about how we share power, um, how we employ together our radical imagination. Um, the work we do in uprooting oppressions is a value. And um, we're from South Louisiana, so there's gotta be a little joy in there. We like to eat, we like to dance. Um, in some ways, I, I think of this work as like, what do you do when you're entering someone's home? You know, you remember who you are, you remember who your people are. Um, and, and our people here are very, very, very joyous people. So I was talking to Deb about this and realizing that so much of our work starts with question. And so I've pulled some questions that have been really influencing our approach to the work here. Um, and one that's influenced us for a long time is what happens to culture when the land that sustains it disappears? And I think that that's a question that's specific to our home, but obviously we know is happening all over our planet. We've been thinking a lot lately about how the systems of control that it takes to contain that river get mapped onto the territories of experiences of, of the people, you know, and how are those things um, that are being engineered out there to create a world that we can all live in and we can all be, you know, safe in, how are those oppressions in some ways, how do they map themselves inside of us? We're obviously always thinking about what histories do we choose to remember as we continue to project new futures? And one that's particularly um, an important part of my life is how can we rewild the land if we have not rewilded ourselves? Um, so I wanted to just end here by showing you some images of a trilogy of work we've worked on for 17 years. This work is um, live performance. It happens outdoors. It um, draws upon principles of traditional environmental knowledge. It is embodied work and that way it is participatory and it is multidisciplinary. This is a play that I toured for about four years called Lugaru. It tells the story of a man and his personal relationship with his culture and the industry that came to his home along the Mississippi River 
uh, and ravages uh, the landscape in which he lives. And the Lugaru is the myth of the Cajun or Creole werewolf in our country. So all of the work is told through the mythological and poetic lens of, of, that, of that, that character. Um, much of the work we create out in landscape uh, not only happens as a live performance, but very often will include large structural elements that become sort of uh, installations and designs that the audience can after the show and before the next continue to walk through and reflect upon. So these are these gigantic waves that we raised at the end of the show when the Lugaru lands in the ocean. Um, Lugaru, this piece led us into a very large nine year project called Cry One, which was and is a two and a half mile outdoor processional performance done in South Louisiana and across the country in 14 different locations. I was encouraging people to be in the landscape and to participate in questions um, around the precarious relationship we have between land and water. Um, these works sort of have music. A lot of times they have food. They involve a sort of combination of the participation of the audience, but then real moments where the audience is really engaged in watching and hearing story from the artist. I would say they're highly crafted and they very often have educators, scientists and policymakers in the room from day one so that we're all talking about and drawing upon these sort of th the themes of the work. And as one of my favorite river scientists says, you know, um, how do we give them enough facts so they stay with us, but enough fantasy so that they go for a real deep ride. Um, and then a project that Deb referenced. And actually, uh, before we before yeah. we go to Invisible Rivers, I'm going to pause you for a second. Please, okay. yeah. Um, so the the perform processional performances. Mm -hmm. This is a really fascinating idea, and I've actually been involved in pro processional performance work before. Mm -hmm. um, and can you talk a little bit about like? how scientists and educators might engage in this in different locations, different contexts, um, and, and just by unpacking a little bit more what you do. So is Absolutely. it just the performance or is there moments when you actually stop and answer questions for, for the audience? Like, what is that look like? It's a great one. They're gonna share a link to a documentary about Cry One in the chat. Um, you know, one, two things about it, Deb. We were so interested in Cry One and, and that, um, there's a jazz funeral tradition in our home and it's a place where we celebrate the dead. So we proceed and process through the land when someone, especially when someone special has died and there's music and dancing and fun. And, and we said, what about instead of having a jazz funeral for the people, we have one for the land as it is disappearing. And so the notion of crying one is that you arrive into what is like a fake eco tour. And so you're broken up into these groups and you're just being carted around the landscape and it's very participatory and interactive. And then in the middle of the show, all of these, these scientists who are leading the eco tour, they get um, interrupted by a sort of mysterious character that tells them that they're gonna have to uh, work together to figure out what's the future of the landscape. And the scientists can't get it together to figure it out. And so that there's a transition in the show where there's a crossing of a body of water and so in the first half of the show is from the perspective of ecology in that way. The second half of the show is a sort of dream landscape where we hear the, the, the story as told by animals and characters from the landscape itself. Mm -hmm. And so throughout the whole thing, you are always as an audience member walking and interacting in an embodied way with the landscape around you. Mm -hmm. And you're in and out of participating in a real robust dialogue about what you also believe to be the future of what we should be doing as, mm -hmm. as climate um, engaged people. And I would say we very often had people who had different opinions in the same groups and real time climate conversations were playing out between scientists and organizers. So um, really we were trying to lift up and the nuance and complexity of, of all of this as well um, mm -hmm. and how we did the work. Yeah, that's, that was my experience actually in, in this work is like that you actually end up naturally and like very um, self-motivated having these conversations that are deep about what you're hearing and what you're experiencing and what you're seeing around you in the landscape and then you end up with a ton of questions that you like yeah. want to go forward and think about so like really really helpful in that way 
Absolutely. All right. Anyway, uh, do go yeah. on. Really I mean, this is think this about is that pedagogy. Of, like, what is oh, that? Oh yeah. Yeah. I would say too, Deb. Cryo, cryo one's multimodal, and mm -hmm. so it was a live performance. It's a music concert because mm -hmm. the whole ensemble is a band. It was a cultural organizing salon working in direct partnership with President Obama's Restore Council after the BP uh, drilling disaster. Mm -hmm. um, so, and it's a website and it became a film. And so the notion was how many entry points can we create for anyone who wants to participate in this really robust conversation about climate? Mm -hmm. And to problematize this notion that all of this exists on a polemic, right? It's either you're with the climate thing or you're not. Um, so that's great. Um, Cry One also led us into pretty deep discussions about environmental racism mm -hmm. and the impacts around uh, climate and social justice, um, which led us into an even more rigorous discussion about the water. And we decided for ourselves that we wanted to animate a project called Invisible Rivers because we wanted to have conversations about the known and unknown histories of those who have lived along the ancestral paths of the Mississippi River. And this Invisible Rivers work, what you're seeing here is called the Float Lab. Uh, we decided now that we wanna have the conversations about the water on the water. So we've created this vessel that is sort of, um, the Float Lab is, um, it's about education, it's about live performance, um, it's about allowing others to share along the way. So as you can see, it can, uh, it's a 23 by 26 foot stage powered by the sun and it floats in the water. Um, here's one of our first uh, float tests. This is a really amazing indigenous artist named Monique Verdan. And this is a designer, Jeff Becker. They both helped conceive of this. But then the float lab can also be taken on land and it becomes an art gallery or a place to watch a movie or a place to hear a musical concert. So this is us at the Bayou Bienvenue sharing an, ex an exhibition about floating cities around the world. Um, this is us in further development, hosting a music concert at a place called the River House where people were gathered to hear music and tell stories about the water. And this is part of our community led design process where we're encouraging anyone who's with us to share their own stories and to weave them into our, our shrimping nets around what they believe the future of this type of climate work needs to be. Um, and then it's also led us strategically, probably important for this conversation to a direct partnership with teachers. Um, we're working directly with this group called the Ripple Effect and their mission is to empower teachers on the front lines of climate change. And so some of the work we've been doing is to figure out how do we train teachers to make curriculum to educate elementary school kids about water literacy. And one of the primary things we started with and we continue with is sort of a big but simple question for us, which is how does the majesty and mystery of the natural landscape we're in show up in our curriculum? Um, how is it not just um, a series of facts, but something that we live and we feel and we breathe? And so that's, that's sort of the presentation there really open to wherever you want to go with that, Deb. Yeah, I have a bunch of questions that will um, kind of pepper. And if folks have specific questions that they want to ask broadly now, um, just remember to use the Q&A uh, function um, and we'll flip back and forth with different images because I must say your images are beautiful. Um, you know, they're just amazing. And one of the things I really appreciate is um, if you can flip back to the image that has the, the lobes, the seven lobes of the Mississippi Delta. So when you're talking about the different lobes and thinking about the way that there is a time sequence to how land has developed and how, um, there we go, like those lobes, yeah. So how the river itself has developed, we start thinking about different concepts of time. And in this particular image, <clears throat> you're not just thinking about time, but you're thinking about change um, over time and different ideas of time. So the river's idea of time, you know, the land's idea of time, and the concept of how um, we start to engineer and how time is in engineering, modern engineering is much shorter. And so I'm just wondering, like, as you're working with educators or community um, folks around this, how do you start to, and the scientists that you've involved in this work, um, you're working from data, 
Like this is based on large scale river and, and flow data. And so is there ways that um, teachers or educators that you've been working with have started to take this into the classroom or generate like more local areas to think about this and ideas that you have around that? Absolutely. I would say two things for that. One of which is I, I learned about time from my grandfather. So I think it's really important that I say when I would go fishing with my grandfather as a little kid, I just wanted to put the fishing pole right in the water. And he would always make us sit for like 20 minutes, which felt like about two hours to my body. And I, he would say, watch what's falling off the trees. And when you see what's falling off the trees, you're going to see what the fish are eating. You know, so it's like there's the traditional environmental si side of time for me in this work. And there's the science and there's the there's this time as well. The grander and broader scientific perspective of what we know about the land. Yes, the teachers are bringing this work directly from we did a teacher education fellowship, but what we did was we presented this type of material and then we 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 were we all went into the field together. So we got on boats and went to see the newest land in the Delta. We did tours to flood control structures. We ate the food together. We talked to the fishermen who have very controversial views about all this. And it wasn't until you, you can take this slide, and you can go teach it. You could. It's the way in which then someone goes out in the field and they feel it. And then most importantly, we structure a process called story circle where we tell stories that are emerging from our own experience of land and landscape. And then the, to me, the teacher sort of three-dimensionally equipped. I got science, I've seen it in action, and it relates to me personally. And when that little triangle happens, then it's kind of amazing. Um, this fellowship resulted in, I think, um, water literacy being taught to 2,500 middle school kids this just in the spring as a pilot. And I would say in a pretty robust way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I've looked at some of that work and thinking with um, others in Louisiana, how those stories are also, as you're starting to feel it in your own body and experience, like what it means to you, that's often where those intersections of justice start to play in. Because one of the questions that we have and, and you kind of named it with allusion to the fishermen. One of the, the challenges that we have in climate change education is lots of people have different positionalities in the world. Like they depend on economies, they depend on, you know, particular industries. And so, and, and their own personal experiences are a certain way. So like how we start to have empathy for that and understand how to communicate across those different communities so we're not being really narrow in how we communicate it to children is, is really interesting. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, despite the astonishing amount of scientific and legislative work happening in the state of Louisiana around climate change, there's relatively zero space at any table for the people most disproportionately impacted by the things that are happening, mm -hmm. you know, and that's to me where we lift up our frameworks of justice to, is to say, who are the people most disproportionately impacted in our in our place by climate change, poor people, communities of color and indigenous communities. So starting question, why aren't those people at the table? Mm -hmm. You know, why are those voices disenfranchised? Because I can't understand how we can have empathy for one another if we're not sharing in some sort of substantive dialogue with one another. So we have all these technologies to, to open a river and to divert it back to try to make land. But I believe we also have all these other communicative technologies that we can use to tell one another our stories. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's not a pipe dream. Oh, and then we come out on the other end and we all agree. No, but at least we've heard one another, mm -hmm. you know? And so I have a real curiosity about how we're using those technologies alongside these very advanced modes of thinking about science, curriculum, education, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I see you just dropped the link that you provided us around the Invisible River story maps. Um, like, can you talk a little bit about that? Have have teachers been using these types of tools like ArcGIS in in that area to also like work with students, or is that more in the community space so far? This this website is just about uh, it's our resources from our fellowship. Um, okay. We were working with all these really. I was learning so much because. 
you know, uh, the leaders of this organization, they know so much about middle school, you know, climate education, you know, they were hitting us with all these articles that I, they were, you know, I'm not always reading academic articles, mm -hmm. but we said to them, give it to us, whatever you want. And then they said to us, give us what's inspiring you. And so the mix is sort of a mix of like sort of academically written articles, but poetry, mm -hmm. nonfiction essays, um, inspirational videos. And we were trying our best to like, see how all those things kind of create a Venn diagram for everyone. Um, because I feel like the educators are like, oh, we don't ever get any experiential learning, but we're, we're being asked to teach all this stuff about the climate, but like, we're not out in it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and, and our point was like, cool, we are out in it, but even more than us, you know, who's out in it, the people you just referenced, you mm -hmm. know, the fisher people, people who live on the water, people who've been watching it, those people are really out in it. So mm -hmm. let's go talk to them and see uh, about how we can sort of make a portrait of how all this works together. And mm -hmm. so I think we're all using it, but just trying to use it in different ways. So how do we take this learning that, that you've been doing with the teachers and their fellows, uh, fellowship efforts and how do we help think what this looks like with students, right? Yeah. Like, have you have you been working with youth on, on the water? I know you you mentioned that teachers have been doing some of this work. Are youth getting out in these spaces? And what what is that looking like? Well, I could tell you if there's anybody on the call is uh is an expert about uh, maritime law or insurance, uh, yeah, you, you right? just feel free to get in touch with me right after the call. Um, <laughs> it turns out putting a young person on a boat is a lot more difficult than we we thought. Right. Um, but it's also brought up for us how careful we need to be also about that many people have a experience of trauma around water. Mm -hmm. So that's been a big learning and a big challenge, mm -hmm. which is how are we moving slow in that territory to create a foundation of trust for everyone? Mm -hmm. um, we are, because of COVID, we got a lot of the teachers on the water. We're moving into year two. And the goal is to get the kids and the students around the water. Mm -hmm. But I tell you what they did do which I, there's a link as well. One of our fabulous teachers created a concert about water literacy where the elementary school kids from New Voices New Orleans, they did an Invisible Rivers concert where they sang songs about the history of the water. And, and every song was related to a part of the curriculum. And I tell you what, I went in to work with them one day because we wanted to rewrite a verse about how do we in honor indigeneity and the current river science around um, diversions. And when you hear a young person talking about deltaic formations in the way that this person was talking about, I was like, okay, something's cooking here. Like, you know, we have a long way to go, but I feel like they were in an embodied practice. They were singing songs and it was presentational. And the more they're putting them in their bodies, it's not, the, it's not just theoretical, you know? And so that's one way I think, Deb, is what are we doing to animate this stuff in the bodies of the students we're teaching? Um, how are you gonna teach a kid who's never been really out into the landscape for a variety of reasons, who's sitting in a chair in a proscenium style classroom listening to someone tell them that they should care about water literacy. Mm -hmm. I, I, but, but you get a kid out next to the water and you have them do a water sample test with a bucket and all of a sudden it's a whole new world, you know, because then you're in it. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, and even those local issues that you're talking about, about the loss of land and land pulling back or the road, like even experiencing and seeing what that looks like, like we've seen that in so many places across coastal regions of the world and having youth stand in those spaces, not for a moment, but if you can for a tidal cycle and see what that looks like, it's really, really important learning to understand like, okay, it may look like this at one time a day, but this is what it looks like at another time of day. Like it's now underwater, you know? Yeah. And taking images of that and sharing that as part of their learning is really powerful. Um, you know what, you know, one thing, Deb, just to say to that, in that uh, movie, Katrina Babies, um, mm -hmm. which was recently released in HBO, it's so moving that the filmmaker asked the young people, has anyone ever asked you how you feel about this? Mm -hmm. 
And most of them are saying no. Mm -hmm. And I have to say one of my faults as a teacher is that often I were, I thought that my students didn't care about Katrina either. I was like, they don't even want to talk about coastal land loss, but I never asked them a simple question. It took me years to say, Hey, how do y'all feel about all of this? Mm -hmm. Oh, then I'm afraid. I'm tired of talking about it. I don't want to move. I already left when I was a, a, a child for Katrina. I don't want to talk about coastal land loss anymore. So there's something there as well about mm -hmm. like how we tell the stories or go to the places that are, are deep. And I know it's not our job to be social workers, but there's something in the heart of the matter there for me as well. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been, again, how is it touching you is a, mm -hmm. is, a, is a question I have. And this, this image that you still have up on the screen, I really think that... Um, one of the things in this region in particular, and as we start to like, you know, look at examples for other regions, there'll be slight differences, but there's a similar kind of natural based solution aspect to this, which is, you know, as we control and divert water, like students could actually start thinking about those solutions of like, what if we didn't, what if we didn't always do that? What if we actually you know, more did control releases of water and sediment in, in particular ways. How would nature start to adjust from the flooding that we have in other areas to actually rebuild land in particular ways um, as we're, as sea levels rising? Because, the you know, while there are some natural processes involved here and rates are different because of anthropogenic climate change, there are like mechanisms that nature is going to use to adjust to that, you know? Mm. The other thing that you just added, um, and there's a question in the chat about it, is around like how um, you alluded to this idea of, you know, use feelings and emotions in the space and, and these like, you know, asking our students and our teachers, you know, our citizens, how they're feeling about any of these particular things as they're learning about it is deeply connected to how we're understanding solutions. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about um, the example of art that you mentioned about becoming part of solutions. Oh yeah. Um, I mean, there's so many ways to go with that. I, I work with a really amazing uh, a woman from the South. Her name is Tafarawala Muhammad. And she has often told me, Nick, you guys are really good at getting the people together. You're a good cultural organizer. The question is, what do we want to do once we got them there? You know, the age old question. And I think to me, uh, one of the solutions is we have to stop working in silos and we have to have the people in the room that bring their own particular expertise towards what we can all accomplish with one another. Mm -hmm. And I'm not, I, I don't fetishize policymakers. I don't think it's the end all be all, but I love to be in a room with someone who can tell me, okay, Nick, great stories. We've got the people together. What do we want to do to try to animate this into some sort of legislation that collectively we can help to change? That's one solution. Um, I think another solution is what the people of South Louisiana have been doing for 300 years, which is sustained and robust gatherings. Mm -hmm. Because the more we are together, the more we eat together, the more we celebrate. You know, from January 4th to June 4th in South Louisiana, there's four days without a festival. Yeah, I just was looking at the schedule. <laughs> it's, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. And that's a solution too. We stay out in front of one another, loving one another and caring for one another and using art, culture and food to have these shared spaces where we can put our differences aside for a second, you know, and agree upon what we agree, uh, agree upon. So yeah, how are we working with all the people in broader coalition? I think is a, is, is, a, is a big one because I know I find myself siloed in the work I'm doing just to survive. Mm -hmm. I, know, I know we all feel that way. I know as educators, I sometimes feel like just to get through my grading at the end of the week is, a, is, is enough, you know, much less to be able to think in a more robust manner about where all this goes. So I, I lean upon and rely upon the help of other experts, whether they be a fisherman, whether they be an educator, um, my local council person, whoever it is, uh, being together, mm -hmm. which yeah, has been hard. Yeah, it has been really hard, especially after COVID. And I think what you're naming is one of the things that we've seen in the Washington state efforts, and we're starting to see in, in many other efforts in different places, is 
how are we building community? How are we, you know, not just building it from scratch, but actually linking to community that exists in spaces that is like frontline led um, in these ways? Yeah, for sure. And are you willing to unpack and examine with that group of people, the sticky places, the hard places, the places that point to your own privilege or the ways in which you have learned behaviors like every one of us does in our bodies that are filled with different biases and unchecked um, you know, privileges. I mean, mm -hmm. that's when we start getting into the real hard work. Um, there's a beautiful saying I always love is like, go slow to go fast. Like um, that I learned from this great group of women, the Urban Bush women, they always say it like, build the foundation of trust with the people that you're working in broad coalition with and then once you go slow to do that work, now we can move faster to do the other types of work. But mm -hmm. we live in a, in a world that's about urgency. And so because we're in climate urgency mode, we tend to forget about this image on the, you know, on mm -hmm. the screen um, as though we are somehow as individuals going to rush out to save the planet. Mm -hmm. but, we don't, but we don't even trust, care, or love for one another. And so like, how are we going to do that? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, so... That's yeah, you're also naming something about values, right? That we actually have to understand our relationship with place, our relationship with each other, and what we value in that context of community, socio-ecological community. Right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. A um, couple other questions here from the chat. So um, what advice would you give to teachers who are working more deeply to integrate the arts into their curriculum or social justice education? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I love to know what discipline you're working from. Um, one thing I've really learned in this work is that um, as an artist, I feel like there's only two things that I'm going to work on for the rest of my life. Um, that is to see and to listen, to see and to hear. And sometimes when I'm in the space with scientists, I get so excited because I'm like, oh, my God, we have the exact same process. We have a question, we observe over a long period of time, and we try to listen as deeply as we can. And I'm saying that to say, I think we have to demystify a little bit this notion that the arts are some thing that includes like people who are naturally gifted or talented towards a certain discipline. And how could I integrate the arts if I'm not an artist? And I'd like to break it down into its component parts. What are the essential tenets to being a good artist or a good scientist and to me that has a lot to do with how we listen and how we see but the other thing I would say is like any good discipline there's so many technologies out there there's so many things so many books so many techniques so many ways I've tried to share some and I'd be happy to dream about more that we can reference and use to be like let's try this approach today oh there's this approach for civic engagement or this approach for how we might make digital stories or whatever it is that you choose that your students are interested in, because that's the real one. What are your students interested in? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And asking them that. Yeah, I love that idea of how we see and how we listen because um, I am biogeochemist scientist. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I'm going to represent the sciences here on this call. And um, I, I just, my whole life has been that like deep curiosity that, and you talk about it as like that mystery, that mysticism of the world. Well, as a scientist, that's like my core, right? Like the world is fascinating. Like, how do we understand it and how do we see it, how we hear it, you know? Mm. And so it's awesome when you start thinking of arts that way, because for me, one of the things that the work in like land and water-based arts has done is it's it's helped not only help me see and listen in new ways, but it's helped me understand the biases that I might be walking through the world with, the privileges that I might be walking through the world with that I have to interrogate more deeply. Because sometimes we we lose that, especially with Eurocentric science. We get like down to reductive type modes and we forget to look at the whole and understand what is our responsibility into this place or into this community, you know? And also, yeah, the re the the great power of an artist too, I think, is to reframe things for us. Mm -hmm. So one that I always have to do for myself, which is a hurricane is a blessing for the swamp. Mm -hmm. 
if you go out into the landscape after a hurricane, you realize that the land is remembering itself in a flood. Mm -hmm. It's a complete blessing. It just happens to be trouble because we've built a landscape for the humans that doesn't do well in the hurricane. Mm -hmm. And I want us to reframe the way that we don't just teach this as a reductive, the climate is ending, we have to save it, the coral reefs are going, but also like go spend time with an animal that like right now is showing you like a type of resiliency. And also like how are we putting that type of like forward thinking, there's a lot of resiliency in the landscape. And so can we teach those things alongside one another, not just to create a false hope, but to just like lift up what is already out there in the landscape, um, mm -hmm. I think is, is, is one that's important for me. That's like a, an aspect of perspective taking. Um, Megan Meg has talked about that and her colleagues in the work on uh, learning in places, which we'll mm. we can pop the link into the chat here in a second. Um, but it's about the way that we actually shift from the human perspective to actually reframe from different organisms or different places or different elements of the landscape. And so, um, yeah, it's a very powerful mechanism, especially in young ages, but I think we need to do it more and more as we age even. Yeah, thank you, yeah. Um, okay, a couple other questions I wanna try and get us in yeah. at the end here. These are great questions, by the way, for folks who have dropped things into the chat for us. Um, so there was um, one question about any resources that you use specifically around water literacy, and it's connected to also, I think, the question that we have about um, access to the NASA images for different locations, like, um, like how did you get access to those and what other mm -hmm. things do you have around water literacy? Yeah, uh, the, one of my big water literacy texts right now uh, is, it's, it's linked in that uh, Invisible Rivers Teacher link, mm -hmm. is a poem by Natalie Diaz, who I'm pretty sure won the Nobel Prize for Poetry for a book called Post-Colonial Love Poem. And it's a, it's a poem called The First Water is the Body. And the water literacy in there is the very awesome principle that like, there is no difference between the Colorado River and the water that flows through my veins. Um, my water literacy right now is undoing what I think I know. Um, I'm trying to unchoreograph the choreographies, if that makes sense, or like unlearn the learned. Because I also realized that when you immerse yourself in a field, you, th you begin to think you know a certain amount about it and that you have to be careful to put yourself in front of something brand new very often. And in my own colonized state of being, um, I have to say that that poem really brought, shook some things out of me because I thought of myself sometimes as being separate, like that landscape's over there and I'm over here and I'm an artist. And I comment upon it and I live in it. But um, that's been a big tool of water literacy for me recently. I, I really love the framework that is encouraged in that poem. It's just really helping me to, yeah, to think of them as the same, same. Mm -hmm. And that, that I can't survive without that water inside and out. It's been a big one. Um, the, the, was a part of the question too about other tools about water literacy? Um, no, really, the question, I think, in particular, the additional piece of that was really about some of the digital tools and how oh, yeah. you access them. And oh, I know yeah, yeah. Have resources around that, but just like off the top of your no, head. No, it's good. Um, the, the, the maps you're seeing were made by Jacob Rosenzweig. They're a little outdated in, in some ways. Um, uh, he's part of our team of people who've been working on this all together for many, many years. Um, the images that you saw um, are based upon the FISC maps which mm -hmm. were made, they're the very famous images of the Mississippi River from Cape Girardeau to Louisiana. There was a man named Harold Fisk. He was a geographer from LSU and he walked the ancestral path, uh, paths of the river uh, taking soil samples. And he's made these incredibly beautiful maps. Those are sort of aerial redepictions of the Fisk maps and they're done in infrared and they were straight up and down on National Geographic's website, you know? National Geographic? Or yeah. NASA. Okay. Yeah. National I, Geographic. Okay. And so we also will provide resources for the question that was asked um, for folks if they want to use that type of data, because there is um, incredible data um, and time sequence data from NASA, from others, from NOAA um, that you can use to localize if you're in different settings for sure. That's right. That's yeah. right. 
Yeah, I like actually, one of my favorite things is NASA has a website called Earth as Art. Ooh. And it's beautiful. Like some of the Landsat images and they just, I've often used them in educational settings mm. where you put up an image and we just talk about how we feel about it. Like, what is it? And it like sparks curiosity, mm. but it's big data. You know, it's using NASA's big data as art. And so they're beautiful. And there's a whole book of them now. Oh, look, the link already. You kind of reminded me of, of something that we haven't even talked about. I can't believe it. Um, uh, awe. Oh, a, uh, awe, awe and wonder is a big part of my yeah. practice as a person because um, when we talk about students, like you can't you can't care about something that you don't love. And one great way to, I mean, you can care about something, but it's like put students in um, or young people in experiences of wonderment and awe, where you're just moved to not look at your phone or to be quiet for a second watch a sunset together, get on the water together. Um, I took my nieces and nephews hiking this summer in the Great Smoky Mountains. And there's the first time in their lives I saw them put down their phones for more than two hours. But I was like, but we were in a landscape of wonderment. Mm -hmm. And the landscape said, you don't even need that phone. Mm -hmm. You don't even need it. And so beauty, yeah, how do we um, use beauty as a tool to like really encourage people to be like, oh, I want to be here now and be fully present in the place that I am. Mm -hmm. And build that relationship with that place that I want that place to be in the future. Oh you know? yeah, that's it. That's the link. Totally. Um, okay, last thought before we close up for today. Um, there, there is some questions around the idea of how we take action. And mm -hmm. we, we've talked about a, a couple pieces of that. But we're wondering if you have any examples from your students or teachers or families or community members that you've worked with that they've taken their personal experiences that they have been doing in this space um, and either move someone to, to work with legislators or run for office to diversify those voices of decision making at the table. Like, has any of that happened yet? Or like, oh, yeah. how, how can we foster that? <laughs> I mean, we could go, we could have a whole nother call that's just about art and action. Mm -hmm. um, so in the South, in the context of where we work, especially since the civil rights movement, you know, some of our teachers are part of a, a, a group called the Free Southern Theater, which was the theatrical wing of the civil rights movement, especially Mr. John O'Neill. Um, and, and through our work with organizations like Alternate Roots, we have been students of this whole movement of people who have done used art to take action on specific issues. That's a real field. I just want to acknowledge and say that's a field of study that mm -hmm. I'll be a student of for the rest of my life. Specifically right now, um, you can look down to South Louisiana and look at groups like Rise St. James mm -hmm. or the Descendants Project, where coalitions of people that are in frontline communities are using art, using culture, and going right to the city council meetings and making getting the Shintech plant shut down mm -hmm. or creating the conditions where the, the next, um, you know, petrochemical plant, the next methane plant, they can't just ramrod it through, like ramrod it through the, the city council anymore because those people are there standing in voice and in coalition with one, one another. So there, there's so many, I mean, cry one itself was literally involved in the writing of legislation with a whole coalition of people on the Gulf about how to make sure that people who were fisher people for generations and all kinds of other folks would get settlement from the BP drilling disaster. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you deal with complex issues? Like I haven't filed my taxes in six years, but I deserve money, you know, like all that mm -hmm. stuff. Um, and when you're in the chaos of those kinds of crises, your capacity to even know that those programs are out there is very limited. Yeah. yeah. But I would say, I would say there's, there's countless examples. Um, mm -hmm. Another great resource for everyone is take a look at the people that the solutions project is funding. Mm -hmm. um, because there's a, there's a, there's a wide array of people doing this sort of um, climate engaged solutions based work. Um, but mm -hmm. I would say it's, 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 it's going on and it's going on more robustly. Um, uh, every day in, in some mm -hmm. ways. I had the privilege of meeting one of the leaders of the Rise St. James um, effort just before I actually talked to you the last time in, in uh, New Orleans. I went up to St. James Parish mm. and um, yeah, 
incredible work that they're doing. Um, mm. and youth are being involved across the Gulf region in different mentorship work with the, with those kinds of community organizers. Yeah. So I know there's so many other tangents we could go on, but I'm going to pause us here for, for now. And um, just thank you very, very much for being able to give this um, public webinar. Um, I wanted to uh, thank everyone else to, who was yes. able to join us today. And um, a recording of this discussion will be posted on the climate learning section of the STEM teaching tools. So do look for that there. Um, and all the resources that we talked about today, we'll collect them and work with Nick. If we, there was something we can't find, we'll, we'll connect them all and link them to the video. So just look for them there on the, on the website. Um, I also want to thank Jeannie Nor Norris, who's behind the scenes throwing links yeah. as we're talking. So thank you so much, Jeannie, for all your work here. Um, we're, we're not going to have a webinar in October. So uh, please join us for the November 3rd webinar. Um, sorry, uh, at when the series returns. And uh, just watch for details in your email or on the website, on the STEM Teaching Tools website. Um, Jeannie will post a little information for that in the chat. And so thanks again for everyone being here, Nick, for your time. Uh, thank you very, very much. What an honor. Thanks. Please stay in touch. Absolutely. All right. Have a good day, everyone. Mm -hmm.